Uh, Madam Vice President, ladies and gentlemen, viewers and listeners, good evening. Um, an English embassy in London must be companies was otherwise good enough in 1604, included amongst its gifts a chariot which has been preserved in the Bremen Army Museum, along with much English silver, and is one of the most remarkable and least studied objects of the period. Complete with decorative armour, sculpture, painted decoration, textiles, and furniture. The coach was closely examined for the magnificent model at a scale of 1 to 6, made by the late David Gray in 1974, which is now to be seen in the current you know, DNA exhibition treasures of the Royal Courts. I think I first heard of the coach in the Kremlin perhaps 50 years ago from my good friend David Sturdy, um, who sort of probably said that there was a coach of Queen Elizabeth in Moscow. Um, and in June last year, on the instruction of Tessa Murdoch, I was sent by the Victorian Art Museum to assist the photographic examination of the coach with photographer Peter Keller, whose work we will see tonight. We were given extraordinary and unlimited access and afforded all possible assistance by the curators of the Kremlin Museums and their international department. To these and all others who have suffered from the coach project over the last few years, I owe my thanks in and beg your forgiveness in advance for sharing so much of what we saw and recorded. <coughs> I plan to talk about Thomas Smith's journey, something about uh, the remains in Moscow, coaches in general, and then take you on a um, detailed tour of the coach in these details. Sir Thomas Smith, a haberdasher and skinner of London, sheriff of London in 1599, was governor of Muscovy Company, East India Company, and one of the founders of the Virginia Company in 1609. The Muscovy Company had been chartered in 1555, following Richard Chancellor's discovery of the Northern Route on an important attempt to find Northeast Passage to the Indies. The context of the 1604 embassy was the need for a Russian, a Russian route through Persia and the forming of a foreign policy alliance with Boris Gudenov um, against the Turks. Sir Thomas Smith was sent as a special ambassador to Tsar Boris Gudenov, leaving Gravesend on the 13th of June and reaching Archangel on the 27th of July, whence he travelled to Moscow and was escorted to the presence of the Tsar on the 11th of October. A detailed account of his travels was published in 1605, which tells the extraordinary story of his journey. Um, and that has been reprinted by the, um, in the Hackboy's account of the early travels to Russia. And is a very detailed and interesting account, which I do not propose to share with you in much detail tonight. The journey itself was quite extraordinary um, and involved travelling from Gravesend all the way around the top of Norway and Finland, um, about 2,000 miles by sea, and then by river and land to Moscow. It is only later, of course, that the route through Petersburg and the Baltic was opened up. Now, the ship may have been something like the ship shown in the Fotheby manuscript of Richard Fotheby, who travelled on a um, expedition of the Muscovy Company to Spitsbergen in 1613. That's also remarkably similar to the um, Tradescent or Ashcroft ship model um, in the Ashnoli. Of course, Tradescent himself went to Russia in 1618. So the journey took you round the top of Finland, and then you had to turn in to Archangel. Um, but first there was the port of St. Nicholas, um, and St. Nicholas preceded Archangel, uh, later called Molotovsk for obvious reasons, and today it is Severity, with a nuclear station, uh, a nuclear submarine base. Um, perhaps the sort, sort of place you wouldn't choose to live, but the sort of place you might find yourself living in. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> it probably looked something like this. St. Nicholas was a little port with an island on shore. Um, when Transcend went there, he found the Muscovy Road spraying on the island and he fired two more back. Um, the National Maritime Museum believes this is a picture of Archangel. Um, I'm assured by my Russian colleagues that it's much more likely to be painting of Varda in Finland. Um, this is actually a reindeer, I'm sure of that. Um, but it shows the sort of early 17th century appearance that he was imagined by that trader of what that part of the world looked like. And from St. Nicholas, she went then up the river to the Archangel, the Archangel as it was called, a place that was established in 1584 for the English and Dutch on the north of the Vena River. And he spent the night there in July, 
he wrote a letter back home. Just up the river from there was Colmogory, and that was the first of the English stations. By the time Smith got there, uh, the English had been trading with Russia for a long time, and there was a whole series of trading stations all the way down the route to Moscow. Um, it'd be interesting to know what sort of vessel was used to gain up the river. I suspect it was some sort of barge, but some other than the large seagoing ship they had. And then the remains of Colmogory are more postcard, and as they are today. Um, about 400 miles down the river, you turn right off the northern Ravina to the Sakona and turn off towards the Lobda, the last trip by river before you set off across on land. Um, and again, at the Lobda, there's another English station. And Smith tells us how he crossed the river Volga by boat um, and stayed at Yaroslav. And there's a, an English station at Yaroslav, and it was another one further down the route. And so, with several days transport between them, he went the last 300 miles to Moscow. According to his description, traveling in his coach, and I don't imagine for a moment he traveled in the coach, because that was all wrapped up, I imagine, wrapped up in packing cases. Um, but he did travel by coach. And I could stay in these very large, well appointed, uh, either at the monasteries, which have large enough buildings in them, or there were also the government houses where the guests could stay. Uh, there on the top right is Serbia Kosa, the Troitsa Trinity Monastery. Um, when my father stayed there in the 1960s with the World Council of Churches, it was called Zagorsk, after one of the um, secretaries of the Communist Party. He was there, unfortunately, in the with the World Council of Churches. Uh, but he said he'd never eaten so, such a variety of amazing fish. Um, so they fed very well indeed and had buns and cocoa from the time he came to Easter. Um, this is a place of interest because it's one of those sort of religious places outside Moscow that was hard to travel out to. It's a very important centre. Um, and it is also the tomb of the Tudanov family. And so Boris, having been buried in Moscow, is then reburied in the family tomb. Um, so finally they arrived in Moscow <coughs> in um, October, and the Moscow of that date is recognizable today with the Kremlin as its center, the great oil center there, the merchant city of the Kitai Gorod outside, um, and then the two further sets of walls shown on the, um, the old plan. One of the most interesting buildings in Moscow to visit is the English church, which is just that. It is a Victorian English church in the northern suburbs, uh, which amazingly was given back to the Church of England in the 1990s and is still uh, happily in use. So Smith had travelled by coach, and then on the Parliament approach, interestingly, he got out of his coach. Still, I agree with him um, in reverse. He got out of his coach and approached on a horse with trumpets sounding. Um, and his great description was this elaborate arrangement of who met and how he was treated, and he was then given um, a better, a greater horse for his entry into Moscow. So there's a formal entry into Moscow, um, and he would be put up in the great ambassador's house. Um, and then there was a sort of standoff period when the, um, the ambassador's department is asking him what to bring him, what is he going to say? And he's saying, I can't tell him what I'm going to say until I get there, and certainly not tell him what I'm bringing. Um, and he doesn't know what's happening. And finally, it's all right, we're going to see the result tomorrow. And so he sort of carried it into um, takes part in the great procession in, and he is provided with a horse and two gallant white porphyrs to carry or draw a rich chariot, one parcel of the great present. Um, so the chariot is the men in my horseback, and other people follow the carrier for the gifts. And I can't resist just one. Dreadful 19th century picture of what these events looked like. One of the is rather splendid. <coughs> the palace he went to, the great reception palace, was the Palace of the Facets, um, one of those uh, late 15th century buildings built by the Syrian Italian architects who built the walls and fences of the Kremlin, um, and it's still there every day. Sadly, rather less accessible than it might be, it's all, as it were, part of the working palace, and it's not easily open to the public, um, though it was in earlier times. But we do have a whole series of images that people made of what it was like being brought into the royal presence in a great vaulted and painted chamber of the facets. Um, perhaps in a sense, the most interesting because of all that um, 
colour of the carpet. So you've got the paintings on the ceiling and the carpets underneath. And then you always have to wear some black costumes just on the one set when it was there. And others wear great gold decorated caftans. Um, so the embassy was brought before the Tsar, kissed his hand, and made their speeches. There's no reaction, and there's no description of the Tsar's reaction to the presence, which included a chariot, two great flagons, a crystal cup. Basin and a viewer, two orange pots, one standing in cup, one piece of scarlet, and four pieces of other fun cloth. The rich chariot delivered to the Tsar can reasonably be identified as a highly decorated fetch that survives in the Kremlin Army today. Now, this image shows um, a series of um, servants coming in with carrying cups, which you see a little bit like pineapple cups, so it's maybe a German industry. Um, bringing in the presence. And I think the gentleman sitting at his table there, maybe the ambassador would be the Chancellor, because you arrive with a great decorated Chancellor from your mom, you've got Chancellor or letter um, saying that you were cut. And then of course there's a great feast that took place, I think in this chamber, and possibly in another chamber in the palace. Um, and the great thing about the feasting was that you saw all the other magnificent plates. <laughs> Um, which tended to be displayed on tables or around the, the central column. So there's a huge number of plates, uh, there's a huge amount of drink, there's a huge amount of eat, um, and as he remarked at the bottom, uh, the only problem is the amount of garlic and onions uh, <laughs> that they put on their dishes. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so, so there's a very full description of, of the trip, the stay in Moscow, and then their extraordinary departure, which happened just at the beginning of the time of troubles, uh, with the sudden death of God's good man and the April 1605, just as they set off back to him. So there are some amazing survivals of this episode um, in Moscow. Um, one of the most surprising ascents is the English merchant's house, which was prominent, prominent enough to be mapped and listed in Alba and Glory. Um, on Blau's Atlas map. It's in St. Barbara Street, the Malaka Street, just east of the Kremlin. Um, its preservation is a remarkable story of the bravery of an architectural historian who recognized in a block of flats that was about to be demolished from this hideous 1960s hotel um, that it contained the remains of an earlier brick house. And thanks to his persistence, that building was preserved. It was restored, which largely then was brief, was put back on, um, and it was opened as a museum by the Queen in 1994. And it is now the English Merchant's House Museum. And we know from all the property plans that it was, um, it was in a yard, and it's called the Merchant's Court, except the Merchant's Court yard. Um, and it seems to be a store building with a door upstairs with a crane going through the window. And inside it has vaulted chambers. So you can have storage below and storage up on top. And it's been moved for the museum, they've reconstructed this um, stone inside it. Um, and there's the curator, Alex Sotin, who was one of the great assistants in Moscow in um, sorting out problems of Russian calendar systems and documentation for travels, and will be coming to speak at the DNA conference later this year. And the other extraordinary survival, of course, is the, um, the collection of plate and carriages in the Kremlin and as one of the display in the Roshanara Palace. But before we come on to that, I'm sorry, you're going to get a little bit of coach history. And that's all I'm going to say about many of the coaches um, is that they existed, and they have round tops, and they could be very wonderful, and they could be very decorative. Um, they could be a litter without wheels, like between horses. They all had these round roofs, they all had pommels at the end, and they tended to be uh, written by, written in by women. Unless you're a pharaoh, as in the top left, and a very long scene in the middle, who was sometimes an omnibus and all comers riding in. Um, but in general, they were, it, it was a a feminine thing to do, to ride in a coach. And the only the earliest surviving ones we have are all connected with weddings. So there's the uh, Friedrichs farm in Graz, is for the Roman wedding of the Emperor Frederick III, as well as in Portugal. Um, she thought they had come all the way around the Mediterranean boat, getting seasick, 
he was chopping down waiting in Siena. And there's a famous painting in Siena um, of their meeting outside Jericho. And it's a wonderful, um, wonderful carriage body, gilded, it's got lovely damask decoration on it. And when the wood, woods come off on one side, you can see how it's constructed uh, with the hoops <coughs> passing through the rails on the spot towards the army of Portugal and, and all the Habsburg dominions. At Coburg, there was until 1945 a very wonderful um, wedding of Sybil of Cleves, a sister of Anna of Cleves, and her wedding carriage built exactly the same way for her marriage to uh, Johann Friedrich of Saxony. A wonderful um, carved decoration on it. And you notice the um, staples at the ends that are supporting that chain of straps. <coughs> And then uh, there's two wonderful, the two gentlemen, the two ladies of the Roma, um, in, up in Valpolicella, along with Count Serrego, <coughs> which are two from two family weddings. And apparently they were simply sort of taken home and put in the box in the Roma Palazzo, where they were sort of rediscovered in the 19th century. The one at the top was from Serrego and Armand on the wedding of 1548. Um, the wedding ended with dreadfuls of macro style massacre when the wedding was there. Um, so that's certainly what's used again. And then the lead, there is the Serrega Alighieri family, uh, family wedding, which sort of started the existing family uh, from 1549. Um, and again, although these are quite a place on Stita, they're still very much the same objects. They are boots passed through rail with pommels on the end. Um, the change comes in the, uh, the 15th century. And for those of you who thought Matthias Corvinus was interested in books and wines, he was actually rather keen on driving fast cars. <laughs> and his wife's nephew, Hitler Desto, is a very young man who sent to Bishop Vestenhoff and acquired the habit of driving in Hungarian carriages. And when he went back to Italy, he took his Hungarian driver with him. Sadly, he died on certain monsters. Thus, <laughs> not at all, the passion for driving in weapons and harvest images. Now, there's a slight problem here because the only picture we have of a Hungarian Kochi weapon actually says Kochi weapon on it shows a wicker, lightweight, fast chariot, <coughs> important with men in it, not women. Uh, it looks nothing like a coach, it looks nothing like nothing else. But the point was it's men in a vehicle driving fast. And whatever the Kochi and Kochi thing was, and Kochi is deadly to the town halfway between Budapest and Vienna. So when they were rushing through the capital to stop off and change your wheels. Um, that gave its name to the way. Uh, and it's very mysterious what actually what the coach was in the first half of the 16th century. Somewhere about 1550, everyone starts having coaches. They appear in London, in Paris, in, in the Netherlands, in Rome. Everyone has coaches. And I think the first two surviving ones, again, <coughs> over I mean, our wedding carriages and the, um, this one on the right, the 1560 wedding carriage of Dorothea of Denmark for the Duke of Brunswick Ludwig. Um, now, a pretty interesting question there, whether it was made in Denmark and brought with you or whether it was made in um, Poland and given to them. Um, but that is, that is what early coaches appear to be. They are four types of things. But it's still got a bit of a medieval curved roof on top of it. We know a huge amount about Queen Elizabeth coaches from all her wardrobe accounts, uh, which I published in detail in, in the uh, Antiquities Journal. Uh, she had a coach with a hollow turn, which I think is this very grand one in the red, with all the feathers coming up on the roof. I suspect that most of her 15 coaches look more like the one on the front, um, the sort of four post of bed with a black canopy. Um, and I think this is what these early coaches were like. They were sort of flat, four events. Somewhere about 1600, there's a change, and they become bigger and open four posters with a sort of dome, slightly dome roof. Um, as famously shown here in the Stockholm Road, which has now been given back to Krakow, it shows um, the wedding of Constance of Austria to King Sigismund and the entry to Krakow in 1605. Uh, which is a very interesting early example of an empty carriage going in a procession, so to represent someone who's not there. Um, and does incidentally in the centre, I think, show the method of driving the Moscow coach, that you couldn't sit on the standard at the front 
and you drag a studio on one of the horses. So this is what the coaches look like in about 1605, and at the bottom left we've got one of this new style of um, James I had one name. He said that a coach cut off half of the German fashion where the room falls a sunshine. That's exactly what it does. Um, incidentally, these words mean nothing. There's something as a coach or a carosh or a carozza or a cochier. Um, the words only mean what anyone meant at the time they used them. And it's very difficult. This day, you look at the pictures that they lost that on the bones. The only surviving one of these is the coach I'm going to talk about. The next of 1605, the next earliest one is the 1619 um, carriage in Lisbon, used for the entry of um, Felipe II, uh, Philip III of Spain, the second of Portugal, for his grand entry um, to Lisbon in 1619, uh, which seems to have had a sort of honored position um, in the Portuguese um, stables. And they, of course, they are the one royal family in Europe. Um, that although they were shot to death at the beginning of the 20th century, they have preserved the royal collection. There's a huge number of them on the world display in Lisbon, and another sort of second bit of collection on display in other museums like the uh, Ilo of Russia. And they've actually got the royal carriage collection. Um, French, of course, burnt the eyes, and we've got the more recent one. But the Lisbon collection is <coughs> absolutely wonderful. So what about ambassadors? Um, now ambassadors have a sort of special use for coaches. They're coaches they used. Um, so on the top left is the coach at Chesky Cromwell. One coach unfortunately I haven't yet seen. Um, I have my plans. And that's one that went to the, the Eggenbergs went to Rome and went embassy and so pleased with their coach. They took the home with them. Likewise the later famous coaches in Lisbon. Then there's the coaches that their ambassadors used to go on an embassy. <clears throat> so we have a lovely tableau painting of uh, Adrian Parr going on to the, Con the Munster Conference in 1696 with a sort of what I call a coach portrait, but in the aim of the picture that's actually shown him and his family traveling in the coach. And then there are the, um, the sort of coaches you take as gifts and actually you should present to people. Um, because there's no doubt that this early period, coaches were used as gifts. And we have several examples of those. Um, in Moscow, of course, um, and some elements later on of this are actually requesting coaches to be bought as gifts. You, you can simply turn up the present that they might not have got stock in that you might be expected to bring. One of the most amusing ones was the one taken to Istanbul by Thomas Dallin, who, as we all know, took the his mechanical organ to install it in the Harleen. 1599, on a great and curious present. And what is less well known is he travelled with the coachman Edward Hale, a little bit of a coach, to the um, Sultan of South Korea, the first lady of the um, And she, she had actually asked for such a thing in her letters, and it was delivered to, to Istanbul in August 1599. And the coach of £600 value was given by the ambassador's secretary, Mr. Paul Pindar. The Queen Mother was terribly taken with Mr. Pindar as well as the coach. And she rewarded the coachman and took, took up the riding and the carriage. And one of the most delightful things this episode is that thank you letter that Elizabeth actually survives in the um, British Museum, isn't it? The um, and she says, I how long we have given you the stuff? And uh, oh you put the coach, I'm not. And that's our uh, up there, so it's thank you for the coach. And that's our down a bit. <coughs> it's rather puzzling, this letter, but strangely written in Ottoman. Um, but I showed it to an, Arab, <coughs> an Arabist who says, well, I'll take it to you. Um, anyway, so that's lovely. We've actually got the thank you letter from there. And of course, they knew what to do in Istanbul with the coach. The great celebration in 1720 on occasion of the Sultan's circumcision of the four sons. Uh, when on the Golden Hall, they had fireworks, um, jugglers, and kick drum. But it must have happened because there's a picture of that. <laughs> then in, um, we have a, a present for the moon, which was taken by James I, to get to the um, embassy to encourage English trade in 1615, Ajman. 
And um, Sir Thomas Rowe famously took a coach with him. And there he is looking on sort of pale face and hot in the presence of the, um, the men. He was terribly embarrassed because the way he bought the coach and his coachmen and musicians, uh, the fabrics were really well faded and they didn't have the horses. So the coach had to be drawn out and built the courtyard by bullets. Um, but everyone thought it was great fun and nobody got into it and he was brought around by the servants. Um, but the moment Rowe had got them, they stripped off all the English fabrics and did it up with bottles of the new style, the proper fabrics and proper colours. And the coachman was given a proper Indian uniform and Indian music was provided. Not only that, but they then built five or six replica coach, uh, good of the English one, built five or six replicas. Um, and they at the moment went off the wall, this great procession of um, English coaches and medical coaches. And that's how the empire was started. <laughs> <laughs> so let's just return finally to what we're going to be talking about. Um, the carriages are in the basement of the original Palata, which is that, that large building on the left there, and you come into the bottom end of the Kremlin. Interestingly, it was apparently designed as an entry to the palace. So you went up the grand staircase and went through that hall and cut all the gold and silver as an entry to the palace. So you, you, you saw that wealth. This is, we're talking about 30, 90 percent palace here. You went past all that wealth to find your way into the palace. Now there are three things you, you really need when you visit the Kremlin. One of them is the 1914 Baidegger, which is the only decent guide from Moscow, which has a proper plan and tells you what you're looking at and gives you all the correct names. The second thing you need is a photographer, so you can concentrate on what you're doing, but someone else takes the pictures. Um, and the third is a pink card. A little pink card is the most powerful piece of paper I've ever had in my hands. Because the doors flew open and you could go backwards to the crowds and you could go in through the front, out through the front door and in through that door. Very, very useful. Thank you, Jesse. <coughs> it has run out of time. <coughs> Now, the most interesting thing one must say immediately about the Kremlin is that there's a very long history of scholarship. Um, in the 19th century, all the national records are in the Kremlin. So the first people like Veltman who are writing about the collection in 1850 actually have the records next door. Um, and so all the, the basic Russian histo historic scholarship on these collections was done with the use of archives. And there are enormous archives. There's a whole series of ambassadorial books where the presents were written down, and they're you know, sold in gold, weighed and listed and valued and written down in the book. And there are also stadiums and things like that. A lot of work remains to be done on that. The English scholarship has been excellent, but has tended to uh, depend on translating what's been published in Russian. And I suspect there's still more work to be done in the archives. Uh, people like Oman, of course, uh, did a lot of work on, on the silver in the Kremlin. And then Madame Kirilova, more recently, has published an excellent book, which you'll find in the library here, on the world carriages. Um, and it's all, but again, it's a Russian version of that, which has more information inside it. So what is this coach? I finally get to the point of the lecture. It is a large thing like a four-poster bed, um, without windows, without doors. Heaven knows why it continued to be used in a place like Moscow, but it was well, presumably used to wrap up on the sledge. Um, windows didn't come in until 50 or 60 years later. Springs didn't come in until 50 years later. Uh, and it hangs on leather straps and would sway moderately. Um, and that's what it looks like. And the problem is that you only start seeing it when you lift the curtains and get behind it and have a look at the interior, or even underneath it, to have a look at the whole thing. And the other carriage itself, <coughs> you notice know, number 17. Coach numbers. Um, the other carriage is a very historic item. It is something where you have the two ends held together, a great perch that runs down the middle. At the back it separates into two braces, which are fixed between the axle bed and the pillow and don't move. And at the front it's pivoted with front axles, which do which do move, which doesn't move. Um, and there's this little eight frame underneath that can turn. Um, so it pillars at the front. And this is an absolute standard item. This was invented somewhere in the Bronze Age and was used in all the historic vehicles. Um, it continued to be used in um, you know, farm vehicles, 
There's the Conestoga wagon in the United States, an 18th century wagon based on continental models. There is the Ravus of the Carrara family in Padua. Um, this, there, there's only one way to do it. You know, you turn the door outside and take the door outside. There was nothing else you could do. That, that's what number carriage was one. And probably this provided some of the strength. In the absence of springs on the body, the ability of the perch to move underneath. Um, now, the photograph there started with leading, and that's the sort of dry pole in front, it's hanging loose. The perch does have a curve on it, and I've shown in my drawing there, uh, not quite as long as the one in this one, which is quite a voluminous curve underneath. <coughs> and interestingly, it's one of the things we learned from the records is that undercarriages and wheels were frequently prepared, replaced. So they just have a new carriage made. So it's, it's the thing that's the least changed, but it is the thing that is most likely to have to be changed. And indeed, the wheels were replaced. We know the wheels were replaced um, from the record in the 1670s uh, when the coach was done up for a visit to a Polish embassy. And so there's later 17th century wheels. But again, there's only one way to build a wheel with a huge hub, with spokes, with two spokes for each fellow. And then iron bands on the outside to form the fellow together to create a series of brass nodes. Um, and then the bench pin, obviously, the wheel <coughs> onto the axle. Although we had one day in the Kremlin all to ourselves, which was amazing, uh, we also had a preliminary day when it was open. <coughs> and every single guy who came round uh, explained patiently that they're looking at. Look, that was the only thing they said about to apart from having his English in the very odd was that it couldn't turn. And the only way it could turn is you walk out into the room to leave. <coughs> this, of course, is complete nonsense because the, um, the axle and axle bed in front, you can see the grease marks dripping down. The pillow on top turns above the axle and the axle bed underneath. So I'm drawing a Lisbon there, the red bit moves underneath and the black the blue bit on top stays fixed. And then the slightest of turns, you just turn the wheel at 30 degrees, you can turn the whole body within twice its length. So of course it turns and all these and carriages did. What it doesn't have, of course, is the fourth wheel, which is that much later thing, the horizontal arm wheel in the middle. The suspension of a coach, and um, you'll learn by now I haven't finished my drawings of the Moscow coach, so looking at the Lisbon drawing again. Um, but the suspension is formed by standards at each end, which are timber uprights, uh, which have very firm iron steel bracing on each side which holds them upright from which the leather straps descend. These again are very primitive item and you can see on that you should just be able to see on Rubens drawing on the bottom wagon there the um, the, the great um, rungs that come out of the other side of the axle. The things you have on the bottom wagon and hold up the side of the wagon are the same things that you then hold together to make the standing which support the coach and the coach body. Um, and there's a nice early example from uh, Pellerin's book on perspective drawing. He includes his lovely little drawing of the pilgrim path, but he's taken the top of the undercarriage. Um, and that probably tells us something like what medieval carriages were like. Um, and certainly would be the way that, on the evidence we know, that Roman carriages would have been suspended. So that's what the, um, the suspension looks like with. Um, both the standard, the standard front and the standard slightly tipped back, but I think this is part of the effect of the show there on the sort of brave face of the outside world. Um, with great support, the highly decorated arm supports on the outside, less decorated ones on the inside, and then with the straps holding up the bottom of the coach. <coughs> and those are the large gilt buckles used for holding the straps together, and the um, those S shaped. Um, brackets used for linking the strap to the bottom, which would provide again a little bit of movement. And there's a picture there of the um, the later type of spring that you get. And this is the thing that was um, these sort of leaf springs only come in the sort of 1650s and later, and then become commonplace. So at the sides of it you have the boot, this um, the construction of uh, iron covered with leather with a wooden step, which is at the side of the coach. This acted as a step and also as a side seat. And all the early images of coaches and carriages 
and show, show someone, some hapless person sitting in the booth, sometimes with their arms or hands on them, hand rest. Um, I recommend a drawing on the top left, which is a wonderful sort of archaeological drawing um, in Dresden, a drawing um, not actually showing a coach, but showing a sort of coach wagon um, <coughs> that they've got in, in the Netherlands, um, a, round, a round top carriage being treated like a coach. And there it is with the armrest and the, the front taken off, showing the fabrics continued on each side. Um, and in the model, um, it's been made so that you can see the fabric on the inside of the front. So the case of decorative step into the coach. Uh, and the arm frame is then held in place by those fabrics. The artwork um, consists of a whole panoply of various straps and supports and brackets. Um, shown again in brown all the details on, on the Lisbon coach, and you can see there already the, um, the axle and bolster and the great band around them. The band underneath is the black one, is the one actually holding the shoe on for the wheel. So the end of the axle is shot in iron, the inside of the wheel arm is shot in iron. So it's iron on iron, it's moving, not, not wood on wood. And as in all of them, it's in the tube. It's these iron parts that actually are allowed to do the work. Uh, you may remember that Peter Thornton wrote one last one about the Medici wardrobe book, um, where the people in the wardrobe wanted to know what it was they were buying. Um, and they put pictures of everything and put names on them. And some of the pages that weren't, I think, reproduced are the ones that had coach parts. So those are all the, that's all the ironwork from the Medici, from the Medici carriage made in 1582. Um, and the wardrobe book even contains a plan of the undercarriage shown with the iron parts, which is recognisable in parts that we get on the Moscow and Lisbon coaches. Um, and even the, um, see the armor at the front is shown that there is this item we're looking at on the right, the, the iron support for the standard. The armwork appears to be made like some swords with twisted bars, and I'm sure that given the job they were doing, um, they must have been, have some sort of steel or something to make them extremely strong. So there's the great bars down the middle, and then all the curly cues on another side, um, that are there largely for decorative purposes, and finishing these lovely cadences of the flowers turned back, and fixed at the top with a great bolt going through the heading standard, and that itself has um, an iron shoe put on it. So the top of the timber post has an iron shoe to pass the part, um, and then the bolt that's coming through it is fixed with a four-off bolt at the other end. So that's the key, key four-off bolt, not the, where later it appears on the not in the screw. And then there's a mud guard all the way around. There's a sort of belt of protection with the wheel splashing in the mud. Again, like a boot, that's made from an iron, iron rod. Uh, the velvet in between, and that's held up on the brackets, which again consists of scrolls, um, the scroll pieces that have this sort of decoration and influence of that. So to come on to the, the great wonder of the coach, which is its decoration, and we have sculpture all over it. We have got the standards decorated themselves, decorated with floral decorations, with figure supporters underneath. The heraldic cartouches and supporters above. Um, on the coach body, we've got scenes of battles and hunting. On all the posts, we've got animals and birds. And then in the painted frieze, there's a whole series of carved flowers. <coughs> to start off with the standards, at both front and back, they have these rather sort of standard English, plain English. Um, bunches of swags of fruit held up by, with a conceit, they're sort of held up by ribbons on either side. Um, at the bottom, the, the bolster, sorry, the pillow, um, has what may be rather later decoration with sort of peapot style curlicues here at the front, given in the sort of green flavor. And at the back, we have the same with the um, swags of fruit. And here, instead of rosettes at the end, we have a couple of little birds perching on the outside of the standard and pecking away at the fruit. And once again, underneath, we have um, 
probably one of the major currencies is the famous heads on the internet. The sort of sources for the, the, the most readily available sources for these sorts of um, decorations would have been things like the printed coupons in Bibles and Psalters about that period, um, which have these little ribbons with fruit on. Um, but as anyone will realize from having looked at the last couple of the book on the sources for decorative work, we'll realize there are any number of sources, and there could be these little top level ones that will tap in with plenty of stuff. And then there's this little copies of copies and then copies of copies of copies. And so there's a whole there's an entire range of things that can be used. Um, but it's quite clear that crafts and that easily availability of, of images. And then we have the two figure supporters, which are quite important, but they are actually holding the standard up. They're required to be a really strong support, they're dangerously cut away. Um, I'm not quite sure who these are meant to be. The path on the right is obviously extremely unpleasant for the person carrying someone's head, and I'm not in the same fashion as carrying his own. Um, and the other one is uh, merely a mustachio figure. <coughs> And at the back, we have a rather tame sort of Mars or Hercules with a club, um, almost thinking of Russia, and then on the other side, we've got a demure Amazon, which is heavily armed, so we don't want to come and use the As I said, these figures are pretty much the sort of thing you'd expect to find on any English staircase or fireplace in front of the house of this period. There's nothing unusual. Then there's an extra cartouche stuck on the on the front and back of the coach. And at the front we have full sort of auricular keyboard stuff at the top, which may be later, and then there's lots of people have a centre in hand. And at the bottom there's a real sort of mannerist locker covered in fruit and little squares. Um, the sort of thing you might come across in one of Greenland and Greece's um, engravings. And then at the back you get all heraldic. Um, with the imperial arms at the top with the double eagle. Underneath, we have George and the Dragon, who is the patron of Moscow as well as England. And of course, the lion and the unicorn, proper English standards. There, and there they are. <coughs> at the front, we've only got the griffin, the greyhound, and missing. And um, <coughs> there, the figures at the bottom is our old friend, the Noah and the Leopard. And of course, if you go to the exhibition, you can see the the proper thing in sort of regard to that three foot part. So again, this, these were sort of commonplaces of this period. From that we come on to the, the great military scenes at the front and back. We have a battle scene at the rear, which is a uh, probably the um, the Battle of Kazan in 1552 when Ivan the Terrible, probably also is perhaps a better translation than what he was. Um, Ivan's uh, great defeat of the Kazan Khans. Anyway, it's, it's a huge battle scene um, outside the city, and the baddies are all wearing turbans, and the, the others are all dressed as Romans, and there's the sun shining on the um, Russian standard, and there's the crescent on the non standard, so you can see who's who. And these are beautifully carved, there's quite a lot of um, depth to them, and character and colour. And so not only do we have the sort of the caftan, the, um, the, the carpet column is wearing, but you've also got the decorative armor that the um, designer is wearing. Um, again, it's sort of can be seen in the exhibition. And then there's a little sort of dead bodies underneath, and sort of surprise birds flying over the head. <laughs> there's not much available iconography that I found at all in the siege of Kazan. Um, it is equally possible, of course, as it it's a reference to Boris Budnov's own defeat of the Crimean Tartars and Khan Kazibiere outside Moscow in 1591. Um, there are images that do show battle scenes and they're the great throne among the Tremlin cathedral that show battle scenes. Um, but there's not much to go on. And of course, the great, um, the great relic from the um, Kazan victory was the cathedral of um, St. Basil, which was built to commemorate. But sources there were plenty, and in Josterman's Bible of 1565, um, there's an illustration uh, of Joshua uh, fighting King Hazor, and here again we have some sort of Romans versus Turks, with 
would be present with some on one side and present with Brad on the other. So this is the book of Joshua. Um, it also serves the book of Judges, the fact that the Israelites are Benjamin, and the plague comes out once again, the two kings, and then you can take Jerusalem. So a man also thought, having gone through that trouble, to make one battle, he was going to uh, do the more. <laughs> again, this is not a direct scene that's been copied, but it shows that that sort of material was available um, in visual sources. At the other end is a victory parade, um, and here you begin to see this depth of carving and trumpets and figures undercutting the under heads. The gun, you can see the guns being piled up vertically, but that's something Russians like doing with the birds. But there's a lot of cannon fire, there's a lot of glass and music. And the Tsar is riding a Roman chariot in costume, and all the soldiers crowding around him, and victory is flying above. Um, and we can see in this detail that he's riding in proper Hungarian style with three horses pulling his chariot side by side. So these are lovely and carefully carved figures, and again, they're beautiful paintings. And there, there are victory scenes, again, just a man's uh, illustrations in Libby in 1572 um, did show them what a trial was like. So these, again, the images were available. So if we look now at the um, hunting scenes, these are either side of the door, and here we have two eastern hunting scenes, a lion and a leopard hunt, and two western ones, a bear and a boar. And one having to pop a hunting hat on, and the other is wearing turbans. Um, they're, they're similar in some ways to the hunting scene in the Great High Chamber at Hardwick, um, and here the boar hunt can directly be linked to the Sodoma scene from the hunting, the hunting book of 1578. Um, Stradamus, when his name appears on that demonstration, uh, Giovanni Stradano, who was working in Italy, um, doing frescoes of the great hunting scenes of Medici and foreign origin for young Van der Strat from somewhere in the Netherlands. So we have the lion hunt, um, a very lively, colourful scene. You see the trees there are reminiscent of that sort of approach in the um, heart of the high chamber. And the detail of the lion, the lovely spotty horse. And a lot of, you see, there's much care has gone into the paint and the features and the costume as it's gone into the carving. And here we have another Stradamus hunting scene where the horse on the left um, is really not dissimilar from that one, and the horse on the right is not similar from that one. Now, I know there's a limited number of ways in which a horse can cross a different hoops, um, but when the fans come in the same place, and put people in the same place, and the foot in the stirrup is in the same place, you think these things may have been off. But the real point is that there were illustrations that showed oriental hunts as, as well as western hunts. And then the lovely leopard hunt, a huge spot in that book, uh, and it's wonderful the horses spinning around. A lot has gone into that single panel. Um, and a very surprised bird jumping out of the tree, the camera on the leaf, and shooting upwards. <coughs> and a leopard, not unlike a leopard in a temper start engraving, but again, how many ways could you possibly um, depict a promising leopard? And the ball scene, um, with ball and mastiff, and pig sticking in action, again a lot of colour, um, and as you can see in sideways view, quite a lot of depth in this, and the, um, that sort of, the, the top of the, um, the sort of pennant at the top of the lance is a, is a 3D, again, is part of a 3D object. Right. Um, now, you know, ball seeds are commonplace, it's one of the things you most usually did when you were hunting. But there's an interesting one on the, uh, what we used to Utens um, series of lunettes, the, um, Chevron, Chevron Dici Villa, that was in a room of paintings of all the Dici Villas and the gardens. Um, the one that illustrates the Peggio, 
an instrument to coach a poetry in the house and also has a scene of a ball hunt. And it's probably stretching things, but if you reverse that horse, he's not dissimilar from that horse. And but again, you know, how many ways are of and killing the day train horse. But the point is that you know, the hats and the costume, the action, it's all part of that language that was available at the time to depict these things. And then finally we have a better hunt where simply you can say, well, there's an illustration that that's actually one of the slightly later than Pascal ones. There's a sort of flying coat in the air that is sort of possibly linked to that. And again, the detail of costume and of the animal and the blood. And these may partly be due to the later restoration in the 1670s, but they must reflect the object as originally produced. And then we come on to the, um, the animals and birds, and I will actually stay all 64 of them, number one. <laughs> but as you're not going to Moscow in a hurry, and you don't have one there, but it's a pink paper, I think I'd better show you how to do it. So let's have a look at the animals. We have um, a very cheeky little sheep there, a nice squirrel, an um, ape, all the other, an apple. We have a joyous bull leaping a serpent, which serpents have legs. <laughs> leaping have legs. Um, and another egg, inspecting an apple. We have a jumping ball, sort of a hyena like animal. We have a delightful little spotty dog. And I'm not quite sure that's meant to be in there for cat or <coughs> I suppose it's a cat. And we have a dog and goat. Um, a nicely observed, I suppose, cat scratching his ear, and then what could only really be a giraffe, I think, in the world. Um, but these are the sort of commonplaces of estuaries and, and animal illustrations, and therefore a particular source would be looked look for. Then the elephants, the elephants are the very specific sort of <coughs> drinking, drinking waters, so drinking the elephant in a very particular time. Um, and a chameleon, a very smug looking chameleon there beside him. I think he knows he's for real in the corners. Um, and I thought this was very exciting. And then somebody pointed out, of course, the moment the Portuguese had got round the hall, um, they knew the chameleon fly. And so he's illustrating from the 1550s onwards <coughs> in animal books. The, the fact is, where the whole black cat will suggest the person hasn't seen <laughs> But these are delightful little things you can sit and look at as you're riding along in your carriage. And if you looked up, you could look at the birds. Um, now, we have a slight problem here because some of them have been sort of nicely looked after. Um, well, they're actually ones with dust, very, very looked after. It wasn't really up to us to get up there and not rush into the tickle them. So some of the photos are a bit dusty. Um, but we see there a stork or a heron. Uh, and one of a series of birds is sort of parrot or hawk type bird, I suppose hawks don't eat fruit so much. Um, so there are 32 of these all around here, because there are eight planes, so there are 32 birds and 32 of them. Um, and we have what might be a bustard in the middle and two sorts of swan, a hoopoe in the top right. <laughs> um, and a pheasant, I think, on the right, taking off. More birds. Down to a turkey, I think, in the top there. And an ostrich. Um, again, I think, I think all these sorts of birds were available. Um, and then a peacock. It's interesting, his persistence and temptation to the peacock with his tail up. But we guess a peacock with his tail down. But we're not done yet, because we now have to get onto the trees. So above the hunting scene and the battle scenes, there is a frieze. And the frieze consists of the panel that holds in the, the actual panel at the top of the hunting scene, which here, within this little frieze, has a whole series of wonderful, rapid sketched hunting and walking scenes. Then there are panels that are dropped in because at this level the top curves out some. So you have these um, the carved flowers are on the columns there. Curved out, and then the landscape scene, I think, painted on the panels and slotted. They are extremely difficult to see in the photograph. Um, 
but we've got some excellent results for these. And we have here a towering scene with someone shooting away with a gun, a rather impressionistic mountain scene underneath. We have someone um, hawking or, or using slingshot in the middle of there to fire up birds, and people coming back from the hunt at the bottom carrying <coughs> carrying a bag over their shoulder. Um, and then with the raspberries and the roses and then the plant, this is one of the series of plants going over their ground. And the sort that would presume derived from um, herbs and um, prints. And there's a close-ups there of the I suppose that's returning to the hunt with the two bags there. And there's the, this little bit of frieze which shows the, um, the those figures. And as you can see, they're, they're painted rather more sort of sketchy and impressionistically than the ones above, but they've got trees, and there's a lovely outline there of the town and the village in the distance. In the rear panel, we have a whole lot of trees with swans. Um, a tree very much in bloom or with cloth with fruit on it. But at the moment, I thought this might be a horse chestnut which would blow the day right out of the water, as I have um, convinced myself it's not a chestnut, it's a pear tree with a lot of fruit on it. Uh, quite interestingly, a couple of scenes show ruins on them. Um, but again, there are, there's engravings by the people in Greece that show ruins on them. And there we have uh, some pomegranates and thistles in the... Um, and then in the frieze we've got George and the Dragon. You see the knight there um, coming in on the left, and there is Dragon, and the other knight on the other side. So it's a wonderful little thing just sort of painted in the front, uh, which you just never see unless you've sort of got out and had, had, had a look at it. And then on the end of that panel, we've got a uh, sort of white heart not being hunted. Um, people possibly contemplating shooting something on the lake with a um, castle in the distance. And underneath the pastoral scene in the shepherd with his flock. Um, another hawking scene here, and underneath it is a, a deer hunt and honeysuckle up above. <coughs> Moving across, we have trees and landscapes. And then coming around the corner, we have some sort of general landscapes with man and horse. And underneath a little scene of a deer being run into a net with dogs. And there is the dog chest. <coughs> As you see, these ones underneath are much more sort of lively and sketchy than the one above. I imagine somebody else did that. And the scene on the right is actually someone going from the lift. So he's got his horse with the bags of a scene on the back. And a little detail there shows the windmill that's partly lost through the falling off and then and then the painting of the building. And then finally coming up to the front, we have the pastoral scenes, the uh, people in the field, the garden, a nice lily there, and then the open landscape underneath, trees, and then a field for the paint pots. And then more trees bursting with them. Bursting with apples and pears, and some flowers to finish it off. Well, the sources for these are numerous and obvious um, engravings by Bruegels um, and again other um, Stradamus views on hunting and um, hawking. And then in particular, of course, all the landscape painting is really is going later on. You've got things like all those late 16th century engravings by the master of the small landscapes. So there, there was plenty of material for imagining landscapes. Though, the ones in the painting on the coat are rather more sort of imaginary, imaginary castles and scenes, and the rather prosaic um, depictions and small landscape etchings. And then finally, we've got the vertical pieces are painted with floral paintings on one end and with um, trophies on the other. And these, it'd be lovely if these were English at the beginning of the century, but there are certain from the 1670s restoration by the Russian artist Ivan Besman, who was paid to work on the
and then furniture and textiles inside. Um, these almost certainly all belong to the 16th, 17th reconstruction. There's the great throne in there, which was brought from Romanov sledge of uh, Mikhail Romanov, and appears to have some Iranian velvet on it. Um, Irritating the concern to cover it with some gauze and quite <laughs> And then on the walls, you've got the lovely um, cut velvet, and there's a detail of that. And it continues on the ceiling, where there's ribs right up to the centre of the imperial arms. Again, wouldn't it be lovely if this was a London production? But I think it's almost certainly um, produced in the 1670s in Moscow. And um, wonderful early detail. And the horseman is not a polo player, but is another one of St. George's sticking dragon. So, I mentioned the issue of date. Um, what date is it? Um, it looks, in, in the context of what I've shown you, there's other coaches of that period, it fits in. We've actually got contemporary drawings of coaches in London, the, some of these early albums, the uh, Teal Shalvan Huntingdon Library has got a London coach from 1603, and the Van Leer one, which is possibly slightly later, um, shows exactly the same thing. So this type of coach was around at that date. Um, coaches were made in Carroll Lane of Smithfield, um, and um, Mary Edmund, in her study of John Webster, his father was a coach builder, reconstructed the coach building community of Carroll Lane um, from all the um, tax books and the parish records there. And the coach business only during the 17th century moved the West Coast and called the Gardner in Edinburgh. Uh, we know who the main builders were. Queen Elizabeth's last coaches were built by Ripper and Robert Moore. The artwork was done by Thomas Larkin. And they were decorated by Marcus Gerhardt, the younger, or then rather the sergeant painter. And similarly, in the wardrobe records of James I, um, Robert John Banks and Robert Moore were making carriages, artwork for Thomas Larkin, um, and now being decorated by the new sergeant painter, John de Critz. And we have evidence that they were painted with antiques and paintings and scenes and histories. Um, and certainly if James' first reign progressed, a highly read those coaches would be produced. Now almost the most remarkable thing about it, and it's the item I'm most sorry that I can't actually produce for you, is the um, is the, the, the delivery note for the coach, which survives in the Russian Archive. And they've got an English delivery notes and two Russian translations of contemporary Russian translations of it. But that's what it says. Uh, it says a chariot, two great flagons, and crystal cup. Um, so the delivery note says I'm giving the chariot. The contemporary account says which chariot was being delivered. What is the problem? The problem is that the earliest record of it, which is a copy, 1706 copy, in 1678 inventory um, statement, and this is not actually a page, it's a page in the park, um, refers to the English box art that was delivered in 1625. <coughs> it doesn't actually say 1625, it says there are three little letters on the line. Um, and Veltzman and others believe from the start that this was a misread date, and that the date of 1605 was simply an error, and this must be the coach of 1604. Well, that's great. That's all very common. Except that the records of the um, Goldsmiths Company do actually contain an investigation of um, three, bad, three parcels of substandard silver nails that had been uh, silver had been brought back from by Fabian Smith from Moscow and had been used for a coach that was going to be presented to the site. In 1624. Uh, and as a result of this, the Privy Council actually wrote to the company saying, forget your rules, you may use these substandard men. Of course, you can't actually bang things, not bang fabric into an oak frame and silver nail, as it were. Um, and the Privy Council letter uh, referred to the fact that the company is preparing a country <laughs> charity of good value for presents of the emperor. So there was a coach being prepared in 1624. But there's absolutely no evidence at all that it was ever delivered. And in fact, in Moscow, the, the embassy that was at that time in Moscow um, had failed and was returned to England. And there was no immediate opportunity for 
that to be presented. Well, I hope you'll agree with me that we've seen nothing in the execution of iconography that is particularly surprising from the date of 1604, and we can continue to believe that this is a Thomas Smith machine. We're going to be amazed that it survived at all, that it continued to be used while mapping windows, and was reverently preserved in the United States. I hope you've been able to delight in the extraordinary diversity of the decoration and the display of carved and painted history and natural history that must have delighted the original recipients. And agree, this is indeed a very splendid chapter in the Thank you.